Good afternoon, everybody. I've entitled my talk, A Brave New World, and I'm going to talk about the new options for the treatment of rifampicin-resistant TB. I know that most of you are here to hear Lloyd's talk because everyone gets into a total panic when they find out that their patient has rifampicin-resistant TB or what we used to call MDR-TB. What I want to talk about today is I want to demystify the area and talk about the really exciting new advances that have made this a much treatable and much more treatable disease. First of all, of course, when we start talking about a problem, we need to know how big the problem is. So I'm going to talk about the burden of disease. Then I'm going to talk about the advances in the clinical trials that have changed policy and talk about the TB pipeline. So if we have a look at where TB occurs, it occurs in two main areas, in Southeast Asia, uh, in countries like India and China, where the population is together but about two and a half billion people. And that's a very high rate of TB. And in addition to that, TB commonly occurs in sub-Saharan Africa. And as you see from my slide, 68% of the cases come from these two areas. In sub-Saharan Africa, the TB epidemic is largely driven by HIV co-infection. Uh, and uh, I, everything that I talk about in terms of drug-resistant TB is going to talk about if the treatments are appropriate for a, an area with high HIV prevalence. So how big is the TB problem? 10 million people get active TB disease every year. And of those, one and a half million people die from TB every year. That's really a poor indictment of our systems, considering that we have a treatment regimen that is around 95% successful. In terms of rifampicin-resistant TB, and you'll see from my slides that I refer to drug-resistant TB as rifampicin-resistant TB, because that's our most valuable TB drug. Around 500,000 people get rifampicin-resistant TB throughout the world every year. And in South Africa, about 15,000 people get rifampicin-resistant TB every year. Sadly, only 160,000 of them are diagnosed, but the more rapid adoption of molecular testing for uh, resistance in TB has, been able, uh, has enabled us to find patients with rifampicin-resistant TB much faster. And around 60%, if you read the WHO report, are cured, which means we're really hardly making a dent in the treatment of rifampicin-resistant TB. But the good news is that in the, last four or, in the last 10 to 15 years, new drugs have not only been trialed and been registered, but have been adopted by national TB programs that have changed the face of the treatment of drug-resistant TB. The first of these drugs was a dr is a drug called bedaquiline. It's a dihydroquinolone. It's bactericidal. And the way that it works is it works on the ATB synthase or the energy production of the mycobacterium itself. It was approved by the US FDA and the South African regulatory authorities around the same time in December 2012 on phase two data. It's been widely adopted by national TB programs. National TB programs in the main are very slow to change and to put new interventions in. But most TB pro programs now have uh, adopted bedaquiline as a first-line treatment. It's a category A drug. And the only way that I can describe category A's is that they are heavy hitters. They are drugs that improve good outcomes and decrease bad outcomes of treatment. Um, around 300 courses have been prescribed. And I'm proud to say that about 50,000 courses of bedaquiline have been prescribed in South Africa alone because we have a very good NTP that will uh, adopt new changes very quickly. We still don't have clinical trial data on the doses of children under the age of six, but the WHO has published some guidelines. I know this is a difficult slide to read, but what I want you to do is to look at the two Kaplan-Meier curves. What we did in South Africa is we started to use bedaquiline, and then we looked back at our programmatic data. So these were not clinical trial patients, but patients who presented to our TB program. 
and we looked at a really hard endpoint, mortality. And we, looked, we compared those who had received bedaquiline versus those who had not received bedaquiline. And the top line is those that did. And this was the first clear indication, at least to the South African NTP, that bedaquiline was a life-saving drug. And any drug that reduces mortality by 40% is a significant uh, step forward in the treatment of a condition that carries about a 50% mortality rate. The next new drug that was trialed and has been registered in some countries is a drug called delaminid. It's in the similar class to metronidazole. It is bactericidal. It is conditionally approved by the European Union, but not approved by the FDA. It's a category C drug, and category C drug means it has a low side effect profile, but is probably not, it is not in the same category as bedaquiline. Trials have shown that this is a drug that is useful to shorten TB treatment, but access has been limited by the cost of this drug, but it does have pediatric doses. And the final drug that I'm going to talk about is the, one of the three new drugs that have been registered is a drug called Protomelid. Protomelid is named after the capital city of South Africa, Pretoria. It was developed by the TB Alliance. It's a nitroimidazole and it works by blocking the cell wall production. It was approved by the FDA in a rather unusual move uh, in August 2018, where it was not approved as a single drug, but approved as a regimen. And that regimen is called BPAL. I will be explaining more about that as I go through my talk. It is suitable for the vast majority of people who have rifampicin-resistant TB, including people who are living with HIV. And that's, of course, very important. And many of the trials were done in South Africa, where the rate of HIV co-infection in our TB patients is around 15, 50%. We don't know if it's safe in pregnancy or children yet. Uh, if I'm invited to give this talk in two years' time, I'll have that information. And it doesn't, it's not really characterized by the WHO. So how did we use to treat drug-resistant TB in the old days? And in the old days, I'm talking about 2010. We treated our patients with 20 to 24 months of drugs. We had an intensive phase that consisted of a fluoroquinolone, usually moxifloxacin, and an injectable agent that was given as an intramuscular injection every day for about six months. That's painful. In addition, roughly a third of the patients to whom we gave these drugs lost their hearing, so they went deaf. So this is not really a successful regimen. In addition, we had some drugs that were recycled from first line. We are familiar with PZA and Ethambutol. Then we have ethionamide, a drug that looks similar to INH, but has a vastly increased adverse event rate. And terizodone, if you don't work in the field, you've never heard of this drug. It's a very strange anti-TB drug that was registered in the 50s. Then we continue those tre that treatment without the injection for a further six months. It's no big surprise that our retention in care was very low. If a patient says to you, I would rather have TB than the medicines you are giving me, then that means that the side effect profile is really untenable. The first randomized controlled trial that was done in this area was completed in 2013. And really what it did is it looked if we could re reduce the duration of treatment from 24 down to nine months using the same kind of drugs. It's like a variation on a theme, not anything new and creative. It was published in the NEJM and helped to inform policymakers that we could actually treat drug resistant TB not for 24 months, but for nine months. A step forward, but not a big enough and brave enough step. But parallel to this in South Africa, we were getting a whole lot of both doctors, nurses and patients who were getting sick of this terrible regimen of giving injectables to people have, who have BMIs of 15. So not much extra muscle mass. So we started substituting out bedaquiline in certain groups of patients. And we pioneered an all oral regimen where we substituted the canamycin or capriamycin amikacin with bedaquiline. 
We used, still used a uh, quinolone and then a whole other lot of drugs that are probably add to that side effect profile and do not treat the TB itself. In South Africa, we particularly don't like ethionamide because it's like having a severe morning sickness for the time that you take it. And so we substituted linezolid for ethionamide. This regimen has been endorsed by the WHO as the short course regimen for the treatment of rifampicin resistant TB. Again, some familiar stuff going on, nothing really new, creative and innovative. And then the watershed moment arrived. The TB Alliance pioneered a regimen called BPAL, Bedaquiline, Pretominid and Linezolid. It's a six month all oral regimen for the treatment of pre-XDR TB. The definitions of XDR TB has changed and I don't have enough time to go into it, but th that who it was indicated for. Um, it was then followed by a trial called Xenix. I'll describe them in a second and followed by practical. Just to reassure you, I have proofread my slides and these figures are correct. In this highly resistant TB population, 90% of our patients were cured with a low relapse rate below 2%, and adverse events were dri driven mainly by linezolid. So this was the first trial that was published on this. It was a trial called NIX, where we enrolled 109 patients, and it was a single arm study where patients were given bedaquiline, pretominid, and linezolid at an extraordinarily high dose of 1,200 milligrams, which uh, drove the adverse event profile. This was published in the NEJM uh, after all of our patients had completed 24 months of follow-up. So if there were relapses, we would have found them. And yet this magic figure of around 90% of our patients were cured. 50% of our patients were HIV co-infected with low CD4 counts. Linezolid caused many adverse events, and what makes sense is, can we get the same kind of efficacy? We like 90%, we would like to aim for even higher, but can we get the same efficacy if we drop the dose of linezolid? So Xenix was a trial that was designed, and the way that Xenix worked is we randomized our patients to different doses and durations of linezolid. So from the 1,200 milligrams for six months all the way down to 600 milligrams for two months. And as, as expected, uh, well, uh, what we were very re reassured by, I beg your pardon, is the fact that around this 90% cure rate was maintained in all of the randomized arms with different doses and durations of linezolid. And in addition to that, the side effects, which are peripheral neuropathy, optic neuropathy, and anemia were reduced as uh, the dose of linezolid was reduced. Shortly thereafter, MSF conducted a study called Practical using a very similar regimen, but with the addition of moxifloxacin. I'm not going to go into the trial design because there's certainly not time for that, but the bottom line is this kind of figure between uh, 85 and 90 percent cure rate was maintained. So in summary, we now have a short all oral regimen for the treatment of rifampicin resistant TB that consists of three to four medications, which translates into 23 pills a week and it used to be 23 pills a day, so it's a huge step forward and has a substantial, um, uh, uh, has a high cure rate uh, in, uh, in enabling our patients to take it. As I've mentioned before, we have a really uh, switched on an innovative NTP lead. And what he did is he said, uh, his name is Dr. Norbert Njeka, from the earliest trials of bedaquinin, he said, how can we go ahead and put these medicines into people who live within our borders and have drug-resistant TB? And we formulated something called a clinical access program, which is kind of a pre-approval access program for all of the new drugs, for bedaquinin, delaminid, and pretominid. But let's dive down and what is it like to live in South Africa and what's the TB burden? So our population is 60 million, which makes us a pretty small country. Uh, it's less than 1% of the world's population. But we bear 3% of the world's TB. 
And I think that there's multiple reasons. The first thing is that HIV drives TB. And if you're not sure why that happens, then you're at the wrong conference. The next thing is that um, uh, th there's a, we have a really good laboratory system where we can make the diagnosis of TB. And our Minister of Health adopted the gene expert as a mechanism for the diagnosis of TB in 2010, way ahead, any, uh, ahead of any other country. It's a rapid diagnostic test that tells us almost immediately if our patient has TB or not, and if that TB is rifampicin resistance or sensitive. So a combination of a high HIV burden but good diagnostics means that we have about 3% of the world's TB population. So clinical trials, as we all know, are a strange population group. When we enroll someone on a clinical trial, they are, uh, have to fulfill certain criteria. They have to be of a certain age. We also want to be relatively clear that they will be able to adhere to their therapy. So they have to have a fixed abode. They have to live somewhere. And of course, we kind of frown upon in clinical trials people who arrive at the clinical trial sm site smelling of alcohol. So we select a population group because we are trying to find out if a regimen works and what the side effect profile is, and we try and remove it from the real world. So if we're getting a 90% cure rate in clinical trials, can that be replicated in the hurly-burly of, uh, of a national TB program? South Africa has 350,000 cases of TB a, a year, and the kind of people who present to our program often fr come from poor, overcrowded, disorganized lives. So can we replicate the findings of the clinical trial in a real life situation. So we began the clinical access program, which is now in its second and a half year. We've enrolled about 159, or that's when we locked the data. And when we look at the data, we have uh, slightly more men than women, which is typical of TB. Most of our patients are black, and a third of them are HIV negative, which makes them two thirds HIV positive. If we have a look at how they have done, of the 149 patients, 124 of them, and this is an ongoing study, so don't write these figures down because when I present it, it's going to be changed. But of, of the 159 that have been enrolled, 124 of them have completed the first six, eight weeks of treatment, and uh, 95 or 76 percent of them have culture converted by the end of the second month. So what does culture conversion mean? It means we can no longer grow the organism from the person's sputum. It's a very sensitive test. It goes down to five colony forming units per mil or five bacilli per mil. When you uh, culture convert, it means that two things. One, you're getting better. That's always a good sign. And you can clearly see it amongst our patients. And the second is that you are no longer infectious. So what we want to do is to re get people better and in addition to that, make them non-infectious as quickly as possible. Our median time to culture conversion was about two months, but we only do monthly cultures, so there's a little bit of the lack of granularity in our data compared to clinical trials. But we ha if we have a look at the patients who have completed six months of treatment, only one of them is still culture positive, and we've extended that patient's treatment. This is a slide that we're used to seeing in HIV. Don't read the details because most of these drugs I can't prescribe, my, uh, I can't pronounce anywhere. But until 2000 and maybe 2005, in our drug pipeline was absolutely nothing for the treatment of TB. What we had done is we had uh, looked at trying to shorten TB regimens by adding a quinolone, that was unsuccessful. But now we have a very substantial pipeline of TB drugs, which means as resistance to the current drugs develop, and it is inevitable, it cannot be prevented by, uh, resistance is inevitable, we have a really uh, a substantial pipeline that we can then put into our TB programs. So in summary, for the first time ever, we have a tolerable and effective regimen for the treatment of rifampicin resistant TB. We've gone from 24 months down to six months. 
Of course, resistance is an issue, and as countries begin to roll this program out, we need to have surveillance for resistance, particularly to the pearl of great price, and that is bedaquiline, the most important TB drug in the second line space. We need to be able to make this diagnosis a little fast, faster. And finally, we have a substantial pipeline, which means for the first time in TB, we have hope for ongoing treatment options for our patients. Thank you very much.